It is Monday, January 29th, 2018. My name is Ashton Ellett, here with another installment of the Two Party Georgia Oral History Project, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Joining us today is Mr. Larry Walker, Jr., a longtime resident of Perry, Georgia. Mr. Walker served in the Georgia House of Representatives from 1973 until his retirement in 2005, including several years as House Majority Leader. He also served for two years on the Georgia Department of Transportation Board from 2007 to 2009, and eight years on the University, of System, University System of Georgia Board of Trustees from 2009 until December 2017, so very recently. Currently practices law at the firm of Walker, Holbert, Gray, and Moore here in Perry, Georgia. And last but not least, is a trustee on the Richard B. Russell Foundation. Um, so thank you very much, Mr. Walker, for joining us here today. It's an honor and a privilege. Thank you. I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about your, your childhood and upbringing. You are born in Macon, but you've been a lifelong resident of Well, I stayed in Perry. Macon about a week and came home, and I've been home since. I've been in Perry all of my life. I say that when I was born, I won the lottery. I had two Walker grandparents that loved me, and I loved them. And I had two great-grandparents, and they loved me, and I loved them. And they lived three stories up, three houses up from uh, me, and I had a mother and daddy love me, and uh, if, if people being born today uh, are fortunate enough to have that kind of a situation, they uh, usually turn out pretty good. <laughs> well, t tell, me about, tell me about Perry and how, how it was when you were a kid and how it's changed. Um, well, it, it's like every place has changed. Uh, when I was born, it was probably about 4,000 people, and now there are 15,000 people. Perry has always been a winter town. It had an outstanding basketball program when I was in school, and prior to that, the winningest high school basketball coach in the country in boys' basketball only when he retired. He won 900 and something. He won 100 and lost 180 something. And uh, th this is the home of Sam Nunn, United States son of Sam Nunn. Sonny Perdue was born here. General Courtney Hicks Hodges, a commander of the first and six armies, I think, he and Patton swapped armies in uh, World War II, and it's, it's a good town. Uh, the people that ran the schools ran the churches and ran the communities. The government's been clean. It's a good place. It's a nice, nice town. And I'm, a, I'm assuming it was a farm community for, for most of its existence. Is, is that still Well, the, Robbins Air Force Base is sure. now the big economic factor in, the, in, in uh, the county. It's true, in the early days, it was more of an agricultural town. My father came here as an ag teacher, and then he and my grandfather got in the farm equipment business, and that's what he did. He also was in the feed and seed business, and so, yes, that was important, but I would say... Robbins Air Force Base is certainly the big factor in Houston County and in Middle Georgia, and really in the state of Georgia now. And what about the proximity to Macon? Was that sort of the the big brother figure? In well, terms? that's where people used to go if they to the hospital or they went to uh, shop and that type thing. On Saturdays, there were a lot of people mm -hmm. that went to Macon. There's not as much of that anymore. Uh, in fact, I think Houston County is actually a little bigger than Bibb County hmm. today, population-wise. It's close. Both of them are about 150,000, but I've been told that Houston County has a few more people than Bibb County does today. Well, tell me about your family. Did you grow up in a, you know, you talked about your, your, your father as a, a seed dealer, farm, farm implement dealer. Was he involved in, in local politics? Let at me all? talk about my granddaddy Gray sure. first. He came here probably in the early 1900s, maybe before 1920. He was born in Danville, Virginia, and moved to Danville, Indiana. And he and my grandmother married and went to Hollywood. He was a cameraman <laughs> at Universal Studios. Then he, then they homesteaded at Tombstone, Arizona. Then they went back to Hollywood, and then they ended up here because they had some relatives here. He was a Chevrolet dealer here. He was mm -hmm. also uh, the mayor of Perry in 49 and 50. And he bet on the Republican candidate one time. He was a Republican. People used to just go look at him. They'd never seen a Republican <laughs> before. Want to see what one looked like. And he uh, bet on one of the 
uh, presidential elections, Hoover and Roosevelt, and of course my grandfather lost, and he had to roll a peanut down the main street of Pier with his nose, and he did it. And that's probably why he was as popular in politics as he was. My father chaired the House and County School Board here for 20 years, went through integration with, interestingly enough, David Perdue's father, who was the school superintendent, Dave Perdue. And mm -hmm. Daddy and Mr. Perdue basically handled it, and I think they did a good job with it. And I've heard David Perdue three or four times talk about that and, and how they handled the school situation in this county and how it, it's been to our benefit that they did so. So how did you how did you become interested in pol in politics? You got into elective office at a very young age. Um, were, were you naturally attracted to that, or was it just sort of a, a chance opportunity that you took and you stayed? Well, I heard it talked in my family, sure. as you can imagine. Uh, Daddy was on the school board, and my granddaddy Gray was the mayor. He was on the city council many years before then, and I had an interest in it. I like history. I like uh, uh, political things, and I even as a youngster, I did. And and I just kind of always was interested in it. Did I know that I would ever run for the state legislature? No. But Sam Nunn came to me, and the bottom line to all of it is that he was going to run first for Congress, but he couldn't get the Middle Georgia Congressional District he wanted. So he said, well, I'll just run for the United States Senate. But he talked to me about going into his law firm. And he said, when I get elected, I would like for you to come into our law firm. And I, you know, I thought, well, if you, run for, if you run for Congress or later the Senate, I might run for your seat. And so that's how I got, got elected. I got elected the same day Sam Nunn got elected to the United States Senate. What were you close? Because the Nuns are an old Perry family. I, I believe Sam Nunn's father was also a mayor. Uh, Sam Nunn's the father town. was a mayor in the 1930s. I've known every mayor of Perry since the 1930s. Mm -hmm. Now I didn't know him when he was mayor, sure. but I knew him later. He was an excellent lawyer. He was an excellent Methodist layman. Uh, I think he did all of the legal work on Elkworth by the Sea down at St. Simon's, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, the nuns are very uh, prominent, uh, good, fine people that the citizens of the community have always looked up to. Interesting fact about Sam Nunn Sr. was he was he was one of the organizers in this area for for Wendell Wilkie's presidential campaign because he he, he was one of those uh, he was a Talmadge Democrat. Well, I, did, I didn't know about Wilkie, but when Senator Talmadge, Governor Talmadge, mm -hmm. came to Perry. His first stop was at Mr. Sam Nunn's I'll senior I, I will law believe, office, which is right up the street. I, I will certainly believe that. Um, so you you were elected as a Democrat. Um, I assume you didn't inherit that from your, the, the, your grandfather's Republicanism um, that sort of wore off by, by your generation. Was that just something that was inherited as, as almost a given well, at that time? that's just the way time? people ran at that time. I mean, that's the way you got elected. Uh, if I'd have run as a Republican in 1972, <laughs> I probably wouldn't have gotten elected. Sure. And, you know, there was never a lot of fault uh, given to that. It wasn't like I sat down and said, philosophically, I'm a Democrat. Frankly, the Democrats that I went to Atlanta and served with initially were probably more conservative than the Republicans are today, physically, physically. and uh, maybe even in, in social issues to some extent. Yeah, you know, when you you decided to run, you were a municipal court judge, or, or I was a municipal court judge. Yes, I was at twenty three. I was a municipal court judge. I knew a lot more then than I do now. Uh, <laughs> uh, but and then I was a city attorney. Uh, I was a municipal court judge for eight years, and then I was a city uh, city attorney for uh, no, I was a municipal court judge for six. A city attorney. For eight, and then my brother David took that over, and we're still the city attorney. We've been the city attorney for forty-five years. That's a long time to be sure city attorney. And, and I sort of skipped over this, but you chose to go to the University of Georgia instead of Mercer, which is just right up the road. What what led you to? It's a very self-serving question, obviously. But well, what led I went, you to the University I, of Georgia? Right out right out of high school, I went to the University of Georgia and went that first summer, and. Uh, and then I went uh, to law school. I made enough 
credit in the summers to go to law school two years out of high school, so five years. I wondered how that matched up on your biographies. It's like 64, 65. <laughs> yes, sir. Five years out of high school, I was back in Perry practicing law. Wow. And there were two two law firms in Perry, Mr. Sam Nunn Sr.'s law firm, and and who we called Little Sam back then. Little Sam had been in his daddy's law firm, and he had pulled out and formed his own law firm. So that's who I was bucking. I was bucking Mr. Sam Nunn Sr. and Little Sam, as we called him. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it all worked out, out, out nicely, and I'm a very close friend of Senator Nunn's. I do legal work for him locally and talk to him often, and he's a, he's a great American in my book. Well, let's talk about your, 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 your entree into elective office when you, you're a Democrat, you're, you're succeeding Sam Nunn Jr. as, as um, state representative. What, can you describe to me what the, the Democratic Party organization or the actual party structure was? Was there a party or was it just a label? Well, if I had to choose one or the other, I would say it was the latter. It wasn't much of a party to it mm -hmm. in all candor. Everybody kind of did their own thing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you, know, you know, they talk about the Democratic Party, but it, but I never saw much to the Democratic Party. I ran as a Democrat, but I, I decided what, what I would do, and I didn't get much help out of the Democratic Party. Maybe a little bit more in the latter days, but certainly not in the early days. So what were your what were your priorities when you got to the state legislature? You said I'm going to focus on X, Y, and Z, or I'm going to deliver A, B, and C to my constituents. Well, candidly, I did I didn't really have a lot of priorities. I wanted to listen and and uh, see what people had to say, and I wanted to do the right thing. I wanted to uh, do for my community, and I wanted to help my community and. I didn't sit down and say, these are my priorities. It just didn't happen that way. You know, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. And when I went to Atlanta, not only did I take Sam Nunn's legislative district, but I took his seat. I took his chair where he had sat when he was in the House. And that's where I sat. And to my left was a tall, dark-haired, uh, kind of an introverted but a fine man sitting next to me, and his name was Joe Frank Harris. <laughs> and he and I got to be fast friends, and uh, he told me he was going to run for governor. <clears throat> and I went home and told my wife, I said, Janice, we need to support Joe Frank Harris. I frankly don't think he can win, but if he doesn't win, we'll say we supported a fine man. And if he does win, we'll be mighty proud. And lo and behold, he won. Mm -hmm. And he asked me to be his floor leader. And uh, I told him I would. I was very honored and would like to do it. And I would like to have Calvin Smyrie and Warren Evans as my assistants. Well, that was the first time an African-American had ever been in a leadership position of any kind in the Georgia House of Representatives. And this would have been 1983? Well, 82, yes. 82, 83? Yes. If that's when... Joe yep. Frank's first year, that's when it was. So Calvin Smyre was the first black uh, African-American to have a leadership position in the Georgia House of Representatives. And, and who is now the, the dean of the, the right. Georgia House of exactly. Representatives. So, so tell me, you know, what, what were the duties of a floor leader? Is it, a lot of people, I think, when they hear that, you just, you're at the beck and call of the governor and you do whatever the governor says. Well, you is, count it, of his eyes and ears and you handle his legislation for him. For example, I handled QBE for him. That's still okay. the law in Georgia today. Quality, Quality basic, basic education. Quality basic education mm -hmm. bill. I handled all of his legislation. Uh, I would talk to him about how I thought we would do on a particular bill or what the vote might be. And, and, uh, I, and, and of course, Warren Evans, who is no longer with us from over at Thompson, Georgia, later the insurance commissioner. Mm -hmm. I think he got elected as comptroller, and then they changed the name to insurance commission about the time everybody's insurance premiums went up. <laughs> and I think Warren got defeated, but a fine man, and, and Calvin Smyre, and we made a good team, and we're working for a mighty fine man in Joe Frank Harris. How much power could a floor leader really have when the Speaker of the House was Tom Murphy, somebody who, you know, incredible clout, incredible... Uh, 
uh, reputation as a very, you know, well, a, a, firm a, leader. Fortunately, he was a close friend of Joe Frank's also. Mm -hmm. Made my job easier. Uh, and I think, uh, I think in the in the pecking order, certainly a, a governor's floor leader is not at the top of the pecking order. But I think uh, with with the support of the speaker and supporting Joe Frank more mm -hmm. than me, made my job a lot easier, and we got an awful lot done. Uh, when I was Joe Frank's floor leader. I was also Zell Miller's floor leader during his second term. That's a, a little known fact. In fact, I had forgotten it myself until Zell reminded me of it. And in one of the ironies of politics, uh, Joe Frank, I mean, uh, Zell went to see Tom Murphy and he told Tom Murphy, he said, I want Larry as a majority leader to also be my floor leader because I want the Democratic Party united. <laughs> <laughs> and as things turned out, I've always thought that was rather ironic, but I enjoyed uh, helping uh, Governor Miller for what he did during his second term also. Right. Who, who was the, you know, appropriations in Georgia is, is such a powerful um, committee, and com committee chair. Who, who was appropriations chair when you uh, were floor leader and then when you were majority leader? Terry Coleman was, and he was an excellent uh, chairman. He really understood state government. He uh, knew where the money was and where the money could be found. Mm -hmm. And and I think he was a very, very good uh, appropriations committee chairman. Well, he's, he he was from not, not too far. He's from Eastman? Eastman, Georgia, 40 miles down there. The the birthplace of Stuckey's exactly trucks or right. rest stops or restaurants. Um, and then Jack Hill succeeded? No, Jack's in the Senate. That's right. That's right. Uh, I, Jack has been the appropriations chair in the Senate a long time. Maybe, maybe I just <laughs> and I don't know. Uh, I don't know who took Terry's place when mm -hmm. I, I can't remember. Okay. Well, you became majority leader in '86 when Al Burris when, when Al Burris passed I, away. No, I, well, yes, when Al Burris died. Uh, I became the majority leader. What can you tell me about about Mr. Burris? Um, oh, he was smart. He was decent, good. Uh, he was from Cobb County, if my memory serves mm -hmm. me correctly. He'd been in the chicken business, and uh, I, he suffered a lot while he was doing the job. I've seen him lay down on the floor. We'd be in the in in meetings of maybe six or eight people, and he'd lay down on the floor, and, and uh, <laughs> he was a profile in courage, really. When when you said he suffered a lot, was it just the the strain well, and the pressure? Cancer. Okay, I believe that was his problem. Yeah, uh, but he was he was fine. How did you approach the job of majority leader? You'd been you'd been in the in the legislature for about twelve thirteen years by that time, and you you'd obviously seen enough to know how how the place worked. How did you ap approach that position? Well, I don't, I don't remember exactly how I approached it. I, I did, I understood what the job, uh, what the job was about, and what I was supposed to do, and uh, it was, and I just did the job. I don't remember ever thinking, well, this is how I'm going to approach it. I tried to be myself. I think people in politics that try to be somebody else, they always fail. I've seen people that tried to imitate Herman Talmadge in, in the way they did, and, you know, they become uh, almost a joke. And I'm not mm -hmm. talking about those funny people like Bobby Rowan and George Hooks that can imitate uh, Senator Talmadge. I'm talking about people that, in there, that, that constantly tried to be Herman Talmadge. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to be yourself, I think. And I, I was just Larry and tried to be Larry, and uh, I guess it worked out uh, pretty good. You've already mentioned that sort of the Democratic Party you know, were in the early mid '80s. There's a Republican presence mainly in Metro Atlanta, maybe Bibb County and Augusta and Columbus. How did you try to to wrangle such a a, a diverse Democratic Party, a party of conservatives, moderates, liberals, blacks, whites? It was not easy. It was difficult, and our caucus meetings were often very interesting. And as the African Americans obtained more membership and more power, you could see white conservative 
South Georgia Democrats dropping off, and sometimes they wouldn't come to the meetings, and so it was a, it was a, it was a philosophical difference. It was deep and wide, and this was I'm talking about even before the Republicans were a threat to take over, but there was actually almost two parties within the Democratic Party, and and, and those two parties being a a, a metropolitan. African American as opposed to a rural conservative white right. party. How South did... Georgia farmers and mm-hmm. uh, professors at, from colleges in Atlanta and that type of thing. How were the Democrats able to hold together a, a voting a, or a coalition? Not we won't say alliance. A coalition of the the most liberal voters in the state, African Americans, and sometimes the most conservative voters. You know, farmers in places like Perry, Georgia, and, and, and down down south, south of the Nat Line. Well, nobody's ever asked me that question before, but uh, even in, in those times, the, the African-American members were starting to get positions of authority and leadership and were participating in the budget process, and, and uh, they, they really did not have anywhere to go. And the, the, a lot of the Democrats that had been running things for years, they weren't going to have anywhere to go either except where they were. And I think it just kind of stuck together because it was the only logical thing for it to do. Is it fair to say that once the Republican Party became a viable alternative, a, a respectable party, a competitive party, that's when conservative whites started to find a new new political home? I think that's fair. Now, I will say this to you. It, it happened in Florida, and it happened in South Carolina, and it happened in Alabama, and it happened in Tennessee before it happened in Georgia. Long before. And I think the reason for that is a good job was being done. The money was being handled conservatively. Mm-hmm. A lot of good things were happening. There wasn't any wild stuff going on as far as legislation is concerned. And I think people... Uh, obviously, Tom Murphy was a controversial figure, but having said that, I think most people thought that he was going to look after the money. He wasn't going to throw money away, mm-hmm. and that he wanted what was best for Georgia. And while Mr. Murphy probably had some people that were not pleased with him, he had a lot of people that thought an awful lot of him. And he was a good man. He he was a complex man, but he was a good man, and he. He, the World Congress Center and, and so many things of that ilk that happened that helped Atlanta, he, mm-hmm. he stepped in and said, we got to do this, we're going to do this. And so he was for all of Georgia, and, he, and I think people realize that. But uh, it, it could only last so long. It's amazing that it lasted as long as it did. Well, you, you mentioned that you know, there was sort of a steady ship. There, you said there weren't any wild things going on. I think back to a lot of the newspapers and the, the editorials, and the worst thing they could say about George Busby and Joe Frank Harris is that they were boring. Yeah, well, that's true. Well, how would you describe that, that, that sort of approach to, to, to the governor's office? I would say going back to Carl Sanders in 1962, 63, with the, the aberration of Lester Maddox, but Jimmy Carter, George Busby, and Joe Frank Harris, who had three... three we'll call them boring governors in a row. What was the approach to governance in Georgia during during your, steady, your career? Uh, steady hand on the wheel, uh, don't get in financial trouble. Uh, it, frankly, it's the way go- government ought to work. It's a, good, it's a good example of how government ought to work, how Georgia. Nathan Deal is of, of that ilk. I mean, I think Nathan has been an excellent governor. But he's not, he's not flamboyant. He's nope. not out here trying <laughs> to make not. news. He's not trying to say something to get his name in the paper. That's the way George Busby was. That's the way that Joe Frank Harris was. Zell was probably a little more of a, a hard charger. Excellent governor, by the way. Probably the Hope Scholarship's the most important thing that happened in my 32-year tenure. It changed the face of this state sure. by changing sure. the university system. Uh, and the, and the technical college system. Uh, but they were all pretty much of that ilk. They, they were steady. They, we had, we've had real good governors ever since I went to Atlanta. I, when I went to Atlanta, Carter was a governor, President Carter. 
uh, for two years. Mm -hmm. And from then on, they've been excellent governors. There's been no scandals. There's been no uh, nothing but positive. It's just been a steady kind of an upward, upward movement by this state. When I went to Atlanta in 1973, Georgia was still a backwater state. It wasn't one of the great states in this country. We might say it was, but it wasn't. Today, 2018, Georgia is one of the great states in this country. It's, it's a dynamic place. And it's because of that steady hand on the wheel, in my opinion, it had a lot to do with it. Why do you think that, you know, we can obviously look, go back and look at Eugene Talmadge and, and for a portion of his career, at least, Herman Talmadge is sort of that, that old populist style sort of that, that uh, passed down from Tom Watson. Why do you think that, that demagogues like, like George Wallace and some others never really took root in Georgia? Lester Maddox being a notable exception, and we have to remember that he was a minority elected governor because Bo Calloway got the most votes in 66. What do you think accounts for that, the, the fact that we don't have demagogues wildly on the left, wildly on the right. Well, I don't know. I mean, that's a very or, good or question. Or Huey Long uh, being an right. example. I the think longs. That, that we've been fortunate. We've been fortunate with the people that offered themselves for governor. And uh, the people have been wise in their selections. And and uh, I, I, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. I haven't thought about it a lot, but I, know that I, I don't know that I'm smart enough to <laughs> answer that. But you know, Georgia's uh, 10, 11 million people, and Alabama's, what, 5 or 6 million people, and uh, there's been so much more growth in Georgia and so much more prosperity than been mm -hmm. in a lot of these other states, and that's probably had a lot to do with it. The people have been smart enough to see that things are going pretty good. We better keep this crowd around, you know, and we better keep this kind of a governor. And we, we elected Carl Sanders when Alabama elected George Wallace, and it was a stark difference and a stark, I think at that time, Birmingham might have been bigger than Atlanta. Oh, this has come up a, a, a few times in the interview. I'm pretty sure, and, and if, it, if not the trajectory, at least, was, was that way. It, it, it certainly might not be the only thing, but I think that was part of it. People don't like to invest their money in, in situations that are in turmoil. Uh, I, I think a great thing that, that happened, and we haven't called his name, but I think a very positive thing that happened is when Roy Barnes took the initiative to change the flag. Uh, I'm a son of the South. I made a speech on the floor of the House. I said, on a sea of Southern drawls, mine is probably the most pronounced. <laughs> and, I, and I sat on the floor of the House that day. When those boys in gray go up that hill at Gettysburg, in the movie Gettysburg, you know, I wanted them to take that hill. I couldn't help it. But it's a time for all things, and it was a, a time to make a change there. And I think a lot of times, what if we still had the stars and bars uh, flying at Robbins Air Force Base? The truth of the matter, it wouldn't be flying there. It wouldn't fly. And, and Coca-Cola and Frito-Lay that's right here in the county. And it was a, it, it was a big economic thing that happened. Mm-hmm. Well, we talked about Atlanta and, and economic, you know, the economic development. Economics is a driver of, of Georgia. It, right as you were taking power as, as House Majority Leader, taking that post, you know, the economics professor at University of Georgia published a, 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 a paper on the two Georgias, that there was a prosperous Georgia and a, a less prosperous Georgia, you know, mainly breaking down to metropolitan and, and rural. Has that problem only gotten worse since 1985, 1986, the, the disparity between the, the, the growth areas versus the slow or no growth areas in Georgia? Well, that's true. Uh, I, don't think you can, I don't think you can sugarcoat it and tell it any other way. Uh, I think it's largely a result of public schools and, and health care. And until we can help solve some of the problems associated with uh, public schools south of the fall line, not all of them, of course, but many of them, and health care south of the fall line, or the NAT line, as I call it, uh, 
we, we're not going to solve that problem. I mean, we can do some things that might help a little, but we've got to solve those problems. And uh, it's, it's a very difficult problem. I, I don't ascribe to anybody that's in power in Georgia that doesn't want to do something about it. Nathan Deal is from Gainesville. I think he sincerely wants to do something about the problem uh, south of the Nap line, but uh, it's a it's a very difficult problem. Moving back in, into sort of the the personalities uh, in politics, you, you mentioned some folks who might not have uh, might not share your impression of Speaker Murphy. Um, you worked with several. Republican leaders during the, really the ascendance of what is the modern Republican Party in Georgia from the 1980s up through 2005 when when the, when Republicans took over. How did you, what was your working relationship with the Republican Party, the Republican leadership like? Excellent, excellent. Johnny Isaacson, fine a public servant as I've ever served with. Lynn Westmoreland, a very good friend of mine, an outstanding individual. Steve Stansel. Mike Egan, uh, Bob Irvin, Paul Hurd. Uh, I'm sure I've left somebody out, and I haven't done it on purpose. I all don't, I of don't them. Think so. I think you got all it. of them were candid. They were smart. They were honest. They would tell you something you could count on it. I hope they'd say that about me. I I, I serve with a lot of them, uh, but I never. We never had a problem. If Johnny Isaacson told you something, you could go to the bank with it. And uh, and I say that about all of them, and I uh, some of them are very good friends of mine. Paul Hurd has gone on, Mike Egan's gone on, uh, Steve Stansel still here, Bob Irvin, uh, Johnny, and uh, Lynn Westmoreland. But they were they were fine. I, I you don't have to vote with people to to like them and and see that they're good people, and we need to get back to that. We we have gone uh, way way off the plantation, off the farm with, with how we are about our political things. I mean, they tell me in Washington, if you speak to somebody in the opposite party, they get mad about it. I mean, that's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I don't, I don't think anybody would disagree with the partisanship uh, in Washington. Is that the same? Is it the same here in Georgia? No, it's not the same in Georgia. I've got a son that's a Republican state senator. And when he went to Atlanta, I said, I don't have but one piece of advice for you. Be nice to people. Be nice to the shoeshine man. Be nice to the doorkeepers. Be nice to the secretaries. Be nice to the Democrats, Larry. You don't have to vote with them to be nice to them. And and this this stuff is it's not in Atlanta out of hand like it is in Washington, but it is out of hand in Washington. And I, I'm 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 sick of it. Well, speaking of Washington, did you ever give any thought to to seeking federal office, Congress, Senate? I did one time. I thought about running for Congress. Dick, uh, Richard Ray uh, and I talked. He said, if you'll run, I won't run. And I decided not to run, and he ran and got elected. But uh, <laughs> I had a young family then, and I think being in Congress and having a young family is very difficult. You've either got to move to Washington and mm-hmm. be up there with them, but you be constantly at home, or you can leave them at home when you're constantly in Washington. It's not easy. I read in the newspapers back from um, 85, 86, right as you were you were about to become majority leader, uh, Mac Mattingly, who had been elected in 1980, um, was up for re-election. There was some discussion that it was either going to be Larry Walker or Roy Barnes that were going to run against Obviously, neither of you ran in 1986 for that for that post. Do you think that the, the, the governor, uh, the, the people of Georgia, would have elected two United States senators who lived about half mile, mile, mile apart from Perry, Georgia? No, uh, that that's that's remarkable. It really is remarkable. But you know, we've got a governor from Hall County, and you got another governor about to run from Hall County, and and. Uh, it's kind of been a Hall County, Houston County sure. kind of a deal, but uh, both of them are two good communities. Uh, but no, I wouldn't have ever thought that. I, I'll tell you a quick story. When when uh, Governor Carter was governor and he said he was not going to run again, I went down to see him. This is an embarrassing moment for me. 
And uh, I said, I said, Governor, what are you going to do when your term is up? He said, I'm going to run for president. And I said, President of what? <laughs> and I was not trying to be cute, and I, I, it was embarrassing, but let me put it in context. It was at that period of time in the history of the state, it was almost impossible for me to believe that anybody from Georgia could be the president. I just thought that, that can't happen. And that just shows how far we have gone from what was that, 1974 mm -hmm. uh, to today. It's been a remarkable uh, upward uh, transition. Did you ever give any thought to running for governor yourself? Gave some thought to it. Never could get comfortable with it. Uh, Is that because you were more comfortable as a legislator as opposed to, to the executive? Well, I wanted to or? be the speaker. Thought I could be the speaker. Came mighty close to being the speaker. Uh, but in, in, in another little interesting irony, Terry Coleman wanted to be the majority leader, and I had the votes and he didn't. And uh, I wanted to be the speaker, and I had 87 votes and I needed 91. And I told him, if, it didn't, if we don't have the votes, I'm not going to make you vote. That's a tough position to put members in. So at least I thought I had 87. I was a pretty good counter. And, uh, but it's just one of those things. I mean, it was, uh, in a lot of ways, I might have been better off than Terry was. He, he got to be speaker two years, and then it all turned over. And uh, I, I, Terry is a good man. Uh, he did a good job as speaker. He was an excellent appropriation committee chairman, and we're still good friends. Talked to him a few days ago. Were you surprised that, that your, your counterpart in the state senate uh, Sonny Purdue switched parties in 98? Shocked. I'd been out of the state. I was chairman of the State Legislative Leaders Foundation, a nationwide organization of legislative leaders, and I had been to a uh, meeting somewhere, and I flew into the Atlanta airport, and uh, I, when I landed, I, ha I hadn't been in the car, but just a minute or two, and I got a call from uh, state Senator Sonny Perdue, my friend, colleague, my senator from Houston County, and uh, he he told me that he was switching parties, and I I just I was it caught me completely off guard, but I had from almost a two hours, hour and a half to think about it, and uh, one thing I said to myself was that I've known Sonny a long time, we're friends, our families have been close. His daddy did business with my daddy in the farm equipment business. And just because Sonny changes the letter behind his name from a D to an R, I'm not going gonna, gonna to treat him just like I always have. And I did. Now, a lot of Democrats didn't. A lot of them didn't. But he'll tell you, when he came down the hall, I spoke to him. I went and talked to him. Frankly, it wasn't easy at times. And, and you know, people were watching. But he was my friend. His family was my friend. Right. And I was not going to treat him ugly just because he changed parties. And I didn't, and I think he appreciated it. He appointed me to the Board of Regents. I think that says a lot. Right. Well, and obviously this is a question I should ask Governor Purdue, or Secretary Purdue, excuse me. But why do you think he switched parties at that time, in 1998, of I all think it, Some of it was personal. I mm -hmm. think he was having conflicts with some of the people in the Senate, and I could call names, but I'm not going to call names, and he didn't think he was being treated fairly, and, you know, he could probably also see that that was a, that was a coming thing. I mm -hmm. could see it, too. I told my uh, Democratic friends, I said, we'd better try to form a coalition with these people. I had been to these state legislative leaders' meetings and hearing people all over the country talk. I said, we're going to lose this thing if we don't. And I tried to do that. And my 87 votes, a lot of them were Republican votes. Right, right. So, so when you said, you know, form a coalition with these folks, and we can move back to, 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 to the party switch in a second, but were you talking about sort of trying to form a, a centrist governing block? Exactly. Would that have worked? I don't know. Uh, probably not for too long. But nonetheless, that was what we were trying to do. Okay. Did you think that was the end of Sonny Perdue's political career, switching parties? 
Or did you think? Uh, you think well, that he was he was I, he, know, he had I, enough I, of a following I worked and support closely base. with Sonny, and I knew he was smart, and I knew he was an indefatigable worker. And uh, I wouldn't count him out, but was I surprised? I was, yes, I was surprised. I'd be less than candid if I didn't say I was surprised, but I wasn't shocked, and mm. I was surprised. Were you shocked or surprised when he became governor in 2002? That's what I'm talking about. Oh, okay, I my, see. what I'm talking about. Okay. I, mean, uh, I, I thought Barnes was a good governor. He was smart. He did a lot of good things. He probably did too many things. I think the thing that, that really... Uh, probably was the most troublesome for Governor Barnes was reapportionment. It was mm -hmm. difficult. Uh, I think the handwriting was on the wall and they made an effort to keep as many right. Democrats as possible and all that probably backfired to some extent. The flag uh, was still a hot issue then. It's a hot issue, hotter than I might want to admit today, but some people still don't oh, like sure. it. But I think sure. the majority of the people in the state realized that was a Good thing it was done. Well, beyond beyond the flag and reapportionment, you, you, that what was it the, the outer perimeter, the northern arc up in you know, t turn probably turned a, an already Republican leaning area solidly Republican or teacher teacher evaluations, teacher pay. So you, there was a lot of the the regional transportation, the Greta who came out of the barn. It, it, now that you say that, the you know, four-year administration, a lot of a lot of things came out of that, the the Barnes administration. A lot of like, he, he was a doer. You know, that, he still is a doer. He he keeps he's active. He's still a doer. Yes, he's smart. Smart. Roy's smart. He's good. He's fun to be around. He tells good stories. He tells funny stories. Uh, he's usually the smartest person in the room, and sometimes people resent that a little bit. But I'm very fond of him, as I am very fond of Sonny Perdue. I might be the only person in Georgia that thinks <laughs> I'm sitting with the only of both of them, but I do. Well, what do you, what do you, um, you know, what's your assessment, your analysis that in 2002, Georgia voters elected Sonny Perdue from Perry, um, Saxby Chambliss from Moultrie, and the House Majority Leader was Lynn Westmoreland from Sharpsburg. That's very different. From, you, you named several House minority leaders that you worked with over the, air, the years. Uh, with the exception of Steve Stancil, they were all from the metro, metro Atlanta area, the suburbs, and Steve Stancil was from the mountains. You know, the, old... the Democrats lost the Main Street, Perry. They lost uh, the Farmers. When they started switching, it was over. It was over. Is there any way... Um, you know, Democrats have been shut out of power, governor's mansion since 03, and, and state senate since 03, house in 05, statewide elective office since 2010. What is the, the path back to power or even competitiveness, viability? It'll come out of the metro areas if it comes. Uh, you, you, uh, from Illinois, mm -hmm. you know how it is. You know what the Democrats probably, uh, if they in power in Illinois, it's out of Chicago, mm -hmm. and Chicago area, and the rest of the state. That's the way it'll be here. If it ever comes back, it'll be the Democrats in the metro areas and the Republicans in the rural areas. My view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After you you let you retired in two thousand five, um, and then you know year or so break, and then you were on the, the GDOT board. Um, tell me about your assessment of transportation, the state of transportation, and then you know the future of, of what it means to well, this Well, I could state. not have been on the DOT board at the worst time. It was two and a half years. Uh, we had no money. Uh, you know, I, I, I'll admit that I've always been a person that's tried to help my local people. Sure. I did that as a majority leader. The Ag Center in Perry being one example of what I was involved in, not the only person. I'm not taking all the credit for it. Right. But I believe in that kind of stuff. But uh, we had no money. We were just doing the best we could to hold on to what we had. DOT is a mammoth operation. Somebody told me one day, said, Larry, up there, they told me, said, do you know how many signs we maintain? I said, no, I don't know. He said, we maintain five million signs. So that's the cool. kind of <laughs> the numbers that, that we're talking about. And 
you think about all of the roads all over this state that are state roads, and uh, it, it's it's a, it's a mammoth operation. And when you don't have any money except to just do the very essentials, it's not a fun time to be on it, frankly. The governor, Governor Purdue, came to me and he said, "Larry, would you, would you prefer to be on the Board of Regents?" I said, "Yes, sir, <laughs> just that fast." And uh, that's how it happened, and uh, I'm very appreciative to him for it. I enjoyed the DOT. I enjoyed the people, uh, uh, people that are be friends of mine, Rudy Bowen, Bill Cuckey, uh I could name others, but uh, be friends of mine all my life. But it was not a good time to be on the DOT, Bowen. Why, how, how has the financial state uh, of transportation changed? Why, why was it so bad in, in 2005, 2007? We were in a depression. We were, we, were, we were going into a depression, that's why. I mean, it, it was not just the DOT board, but it was, uh, we were into, into what I call a depression in this law office. I made more money practicing law in 2007 than any year I ever practiced. I didn't hardly make any after September of that year. It was like cutting off water, just like that, 2007. And that, it, was, it was a rough. I've had grown men to sit in this very chair right here and cry because they were losing everything that they had worked for for years. Mm. Well, you know, moving over to the USG, um, you know the university system. Obviously, the impact was 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 pretty great on the university system as well. But what has the university system meant to the state? Uh, the two, the three states in the in the country that have two colleges in the top twenty five. Georgia is one of them. University of Georgia and Georgia Tech. Not necessarily in that order, but I like to put Georgia first. Although I'm <laughs> we, don't, we don't need to rank. They, if somebody wants to know, they can go look it up. <laughs> I, I, uh, you know, I, I'm crazy about the folks at Georgia Tech. and Bud Peterson is a great president, but that's amazing. That's amazing. I mean, that that speaks volumes. And and uh, we've got a outstanding university system and an outstanding technical college system. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, uh, that is a, a driving force in this state. Hope Scholarship, people that were able to get the Hope, Hope Scholarship today, if it had not been here, they would have gone to Vanderbilt or Duke or uh, Harvard or Yale or somewhere like that. They wouldn't have stayed in Georgia. Now they stay in here. Made a huge difference to this state. Looking back, you, know, you you were in the legislature for about 32 years, state government longer, if you want to talk GOT and, and, and the Board of Trustees. Is the flag the most important, or, or, or the when you look back most fondly on, on you know, legislation that you helped pass or policies you helped craft, what, what, are the, what are the things that come to mind? Hope Scholarship's number one. Mm-hmm. Most exciting thing that ever happened was when Ray Charles came to the floor of the House and we adopted George on my mind as our state song. Uh, that was big. I mean, that was exciting. The flag change was electric. Uh, there was a lot of uh, maneuvering all within the rules of the House. Uh, it was a surprise thing. Uh, it was electric. You could cut the air in the in the in the house chamber with a knife almost and uh, that was big uh hope scholarship i think that's number one i really do uh all of those were big and uh qbe by joe frank harris was a mighty big big uh, piece of legislation that's lasted a long time who thought who would have thought that qbe e would still be here what 30 30 something years i was gonna later? say yeah uh, it's amazing. Some, so you know, it, they they criticize it, but they every, can't come it, up with anything any better. Every session. Every I mean, they, session. They, they, they there were rumblings about it this year, but it's still there. So you must have done something. You know, z- zooming out a little bit, you know, there used to be talk of you know Sam Nunn and, 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 and Jimmy Carter. Those were Georgia Democrats. People, I'm a Georgia Democrat. Does that word, does that, that phrase have any meaning anymore? Not the meaning it used to have. They just, 
I think the future there will be Democrats and there will be Republicans. I mean, it, it's, I don't think it has the meaning it used to have. You know, the Republican Party was such a, a non-entity in the state for so many years um, following Reconstruction. And there were rumblings of re Republicanism for a while and it would taper off. It is the solid majority party in this state. Why do you think the party evolved the way it has? And, and it's, why did the Republicans come to power and why have they been so... Uh, successful holding power? Well, I don't think the Republican can sit back and say, we're going to have it forever, we're going to have it for a long time into the future. If you look at the, <clears throat> some of the elections where they're getting, you know, 53% of the vote, 55% of the vote, it doesn't take a lot to change it. Uh, fortunately for the Republicans and fortunately for Georgians, we've had mighty good people from the Republican Party in high office. We've talked about we've talked about uh, Nathan Deal. We've talked about Sonny Perdue. What about Saxby Chambliss? Uh, Johnny Isaacson. Johnny Isaacson. I mean, you can't beat Johnny Isaacson. Uh, nobody can beat him. I don't mean you can't beat him as far as getting the job done. And he's just he's good. And as long as <clears throat> the Republicans continue with those kind of People in office, I think they, they can continue to hold on, but one of these days it'll probably switch back. Well, do you think, maybe we've already touched on this a little bit, but the, the, the biggest threat to Republicans as a majority party, is it sort of deviating from that that approach to governance? I think um, the biggest or danger is it to the Republicans is going too far to the right. Okay. I still believe that the vast majority of the people in this state and in this country, in the middle. Uh, and if they go too far to the right, I think they could they could lose it. Mm -hmm. If you had a had a, a very right wing Republican candidate and a middle of the road a moderate Democrat uh, that's charismatic, attractive, decent, uh, you know, things happen. Well, I mean. We're in an election year, um, and on the Democratic side, you, you you have two candidates, two very very you know accomplished, well spoken, educated uh, candidates in Stacey Abrams and Stacey Evans. I think Stacey Evans has consciously pitched herself as sort of that centrist, moderate um, candidate. But are the parties so polarized now that the parties are going to nominate? either a hard conservative in the Republican Party and a hard left liberal in the Democratic Party. Do you think that it's just the way the party structures work now that maybe the kind of... I don't think the the Republicans of, are going to have, based on... I, I'm not fully familiar with all of the candidates sure, sure. and their philosophies, but I don't think the Republicans have necessarily got a... Uh, uh, the, the main candidates, I wouldn't characterize them as being hard right mm -hmm. uh, uh, candidates. I don't think you're going to have that. Now, I know uh, Stacey Evans, I like her very much. She's very articulate. She's, uh, But uh, I think unless the Republicans do veer uh, hard to the right, that they're going to be difficult to defeat. Sure, sure. What do you what do you think about you know the the response we're talking post two thousand sixteen with the with the surprising election of, of Donald Trump that the Democrats have have clawed back seats that have been held by Republicans in, in my hometown in Athens two two legislators um, the Buckhead seat held in the state Senate by Hunter Hill who is running for governor uh, Democrats have taken it back do you think that is a reaction? to sort of the national level politics, or do you think that gets to you know, sort of deeper structural shifts? Um, I think it's a reaction to some extent. Uh, I don't know the politics up then, so it's kind of hard for me to say, sure. but I think there's going to be a reaction. What do you think Georgia politics, you know, the political parties, what do they look like 10, 20 years down the road? In, in, if you take into account the demographic changes, the economic shifts that are going on in the state? 
Well, if you'd have asked me that 20 years ago what I thought it would be like today, I'd probably miss it so badly that I better not tell you what I think in 20 years. And things change faster now than they used to. Everybody's got this stuff in their hand. They think they know everything. And to some extent, they do know everything. That's what makes leadership so difficult. You can't lead people that think they know more than you do. So what's 20 years from now? I, I, I wouldn't venture a guess. I don't know what it's going to be. It's It's... It's changed a lot in the last 20 years. I think it'll change even more in the next 20. How it'll change, I don't know. Well, you just, you, you, you know, it's just wrapping up here. You, you stepped down from the Board of Regents in December. So what, what, what are your, your future ventures and uh, adventures Well, I've got a mother like? that on February the 10th will be 98 years old. Well, congratulations I to I try to mom. go see her every day. I've got a brother that's a law partner here that has had leukemia he's been at emory about 150 days and i've been trying to do a lot of his work and mine too uh you know i've got a lot to do to keep me busy here that's that's really the reason i'm back here that's the reason i'm off of the board of regents i think that and and my wife is a wonderful person i want to spend more time with her while we both can enjoy each other so uh, my daddy told me many times, he said, Larry, it's a smart man that knows when to put something down. It was time for me to put it down. It's that plain and simple. I enjoyed the Regents. I liked the people. I got along fine with them. I was able to get stuff done that I wanted to get done. Uh, it, it's these other things that are bigger things. There's bigger things in politics. Uh, there's bigger things than going to Atlanta. There's more important things, and I'm trying to focus on the more important things. Well, as my my my, my parents and my in-laws would say, the grandkids are probably they're the smallest things, but they might be the most important things. So yes, sir. you get to do that yes, too I've when got you're that back too. home. Yes, sir. Well, Mr. Walker, thank you very much for taking an hour out of your your afternoon on a beautiful afternoon here in Perry, Georgia. I've enjoyed it. I, uh, I always enjoy talking about these things, and uh, I, I think things are going to be all right. They're going to be different, but, you know, I haven't missed any meals, and I've been warm in the winter and cool in the summer, and, and I've got, got a lot of relatives here, and I see them and enjoy them, and a lot of friends, and beyond that, you know, there's not much, really. Well, thank you very much for, for talking history, politics, and 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 being uh, an optimistic voice in, in some interesting times in which we live. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it.